another week, another question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on the channel, on any uh, topic, any video, any of the question shows, just type in your question. I will spot it, grab my favorites, and answer them here. As always, shorter questions are better. I can't do the big long essays. So if you want your question to get answered, that's the best way to do it. All right, well, let's get going. Liam.edu, would nuclear winter solve global warming? Rather than wiping out the ecosystem by freezing it to death, could we just cancel out the effects of climate change by detonating an X number of nukes? If so, approximately how many nukes could solve global warming? If we're at the point where the only way that we can solve the terrible global warming problem that we've got ourselves into is by detonating nuclear weapons to try and offset it, then we're in a really bad place. And in fact, there's a bunch of these, these massive geoengineering ideas to try and solve global warming, like uh, dumping container loads of iron into the oceans to try and promote algae growth, or uh, painting the Arctic silver and, and things like that. And the, the problem with all of these ideas is one, they require engineering at a scale that we can scarcely comprehend. But the other part is that you just don't know what the unintended consequences are. If you let off a bunch of nuclear weapons, you would kick material up into the, up into, and, and darken the atmosphere and probably cut some of the sunlight and cut down some of the temperatures. But then how long would that last until until the particulate was gone and the, and the global warming returned. The bottom line is, is that we need to reduce our carbon emissions and we need to uh, do it in a much more uh, long-term, sustainable way. I, I love the audacity of these kinds of ideas, but I just, I, you know that there would just be unintended consequences. It's, it's like introducing animals to new environments. And you're like, oh, we're going to bring in the rabbits and they'll handle the plants and then the rabbits go out of control. So anyway, that's, that is always the problem with these kinds of solutions. Streak one, would it be possible to advertise using satellites? Like, would it be possible to build a giant billboard to stick in orbit and put advertisements on it? It'd be super intrusive, but an interesting concept. Please, no. I mean, we already have advertising everywhere. And to put ads in space, yes, yes, it would be possible. Uh, it would be, to have the ad be visible, you would need to have it fairly close to the Earth, say the distance that the International Space Station orbits. And to have it, right now, you can see with binoculars, the International Space Station, you can see the structure of it. So you would imagine to have something that was like, say, a I don't know, some cola ad just floating. Oh, I don't like this idea at all. <laughs> this cola ad fly past the sky every 90 minutes or so. Uh, it would have to be really big, like, like Death Star big. But, you know, it could be made out of um, foil, really lightweight foil. Now, the problem is, is that it would want to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, so you'd have to have some way to, to keep it boosted up. So maybe you'd have some rigid structure on it and some kind of ion engine that would keep it boosted so it kept close but didn't fall into the Earth's atmosphere. Or maybe you could put like, like lasers on it and they would shoot down, at the, down from space and so it would be lit up even at night. Yeah, yes, I would say that that is within our engineering capability to carry out and I really hope that nobody ever puts their mind to it because that would just be like, that's the last place that we need ads. Easy Tiger 10. I understand the shuttle's external fuel tank could have been carried to orbit and used for accommodation or storage for a space station, for example. Why did this never happen? It's true that with the configuration of the space shuttle, with the solid rocket boosters and the main fuel tank with the orbiter on top, that that configuration probably could have carried that external fuel tank to orbit. And then they could have left it in orbit and then they could have attached a bunch of them together and made some kind of space station. But this is one of the series of compromises that NASA had to make when they were building the space shuttle, which is an amazing machine, one of the most complicated, ambitious programs that humanity has ever undertaken, which was that if they built that kind of capability, it would need more fuel to carry that last little bit up into orbit, which would mean that it would have less payload, which would mean that, that they would have less capability for their missions. And although 
it is theoretically possible, this is one of the series of compromises that NASA chose to make because they didn't know if there would be down the road there'd need to be some future space station. And so, and so this is just, that's just where they went with it. Chris Gonzalez. In Carl Sagan's book, Pale Blue Dot, he mentions that a distance of around 550 AU, gravitational lensing from the sun should theoretically allow us to see the universe with unmatched clarity. If we had the tech to do this, what would be the first thing or place you'd want to look at or why? This is an awesome idea, right? You, you set up 550 astronomical units away from the sun and you set up some kind of telescope mirror. And what happens is light, it passes the sun, gets the gravity of the sun, bends the light, and the objective point, the point of focus for all of this light coming in is this space station that you've set up, this receiver and then you could observe places out in space. It'd be very difficult though, right? Because you'd imagine you'd be 550 AU, which, uh, what is that? That's like seven times the distance from Pluto to the sun. I'm not sure the exact amount, but it's huge. And so this would take hundreds and hundreds of years to go all the way around the sun. So you would get this very specific lineup of points that you'd be able to view. So you wouldn't really have a lot of choice about what you saw. You could send out your mission, know what one first thing you wanted to observe, but then you would have to slowly orbit the sun and just get what you could. I would want to see Alpha Centauri, probably, because it's a very close star system, very similar stars to Earth. I'd want to be able to observe those stars and see if there's planets, Earth-like planets, uh, you could imagine the capability of a telescope like that. You could see the atmosphere of those planets if they're there, the moons, and really get a sense if maybe there's some kind of civilization on the next star over. That would be my preference, but just to have that capability going would be amazing. I mean, you could set up a bunch of them, right? You could set up a ring of these satellites all at that point, and they're all just orbiting around the sun, all using the sun as a lens to observe the deeper universe. I love the idea. It just is an enormous engineering problem. Frog legs. What do you think the creature's bioform for Venus will look like? I'm imagining floating krill and airborne microorganisms and eventually large flying coral reefs. And if humanity disappeared, how do you think life would evolve? This isn't exactly my realm of expertise, but I love the idea, so I'm gonna try and take a shot at it. The atmosphere of Venus at the high atmosphere, say 70 kilometers up, the temperature and pressure are similar to Earth. It's carbon dioxide atmosphere. You would imagine, I, I guess, some kind of probably bacteria that is, or some kind of you know plant-based materials like, like so phytoplankton, something that can harvest the sunlight, use the carbon dioxide, create various byproducts, fall to the surface. That's kind of what you would expect. Now, maybe you could evolve some kind of creature that is able to consume sunlight, is able to, or some of the other chemicals that are maybe in the atmosphere, they would definitely have to be able to float. Um, maybe they would generate like gas bags and they would generate some kind of lifting gas inside of them and they could float around. It sounds like the kind of thing that we would definitely have to have a hand in to actually create to get those life forms and it helps sort of force evolve them to make it to Venus. Uh, I don't know if they could keep going if, if humanity wasn't there and we were there to keep trying to sort of introduce new versions and variants. I mean, you look at the kinds of animals that we have today, the, the domesticated animals, very few of those would be able to survive without human beings really taking care of them. I mean, look at various breeds of dogs, cats, uh, farm animals, things like that. So I don't know, I, but it's super fascinating. I'd love to see, you know, various imaginative ways that we could create life forms. And if we do have future colonies on Venus, that'll be the kind of thing that we're probably gonna try and imagine. Davinda Amarthunga. I'm searching all over Google, YouTube for satellite footage. Can't seem to find anything that supports the existing claim of thousands of satellites orbiting Earth. What the hell, NASA? Anyone who's spent any time outside knows there's tons of satellites. At night, all you have to do is look up and just wait a few minutes and you will see a satellite go overhead. You'll see what looks like a star go overhead. 
You can go to many places on the internet. You can get a schedule of when the International Space Station is going to fly right over where you live. Then go outside and exactly on schedule, the brightest star in the sky is going to appear and cross the sky exactly as expected. And if you take a pair of binoculars, you can look at that object and you will see the International Space Station. You will see its little TIE fighter shape structure with your own eyeballs. So if you think that, that there's some kind of massive cover-up, you clearly haven't spent enough time just outside looking up. Which, I don't know, you live in a place with a lot of light pollution or something, so you don't see a nice dark sky. But you can live in New York City and still see the International Space Station go overhead. So I, I don't know how much more evidence you require. Maybe go to space and then be inside the space station and then... then <laughs> How do people not believe in satellites? Ignaty Romanov Chernigovsky. Let's say aliens land landers on Earth with tech level similar to ours, but assuming they don't land on someone's house, would they be able to tell that humans even existed? How much would an orbiter tell them? Would they come back with a natural explanation for how those wheat field things appeared on Earth's surface? There are structures on Earth that could only be created by some kind of intelligent civilization. Especially at night, right? You, a, an orbiter could c be going around the Earth at night and see the lights from cities and factories and houses and things like that and know that there's some kind of intelligent civilization that is illuminating the dark parts of the planet at night. So I think an orbiter would know in a heartbeat. Now, if you had a lander come down and like maybe they couldn't see through the atmosphere and the lander came down, then, then absolutely. It really just depends on where it lands, right? If it lands near structures, near factories, things like that, then it would know. If it lands in the ocean or in the middle of a forest like this, then chances are it, they might not know. And so you can see how when we explore other worlds in the solar system, the amount that we've actually explored with, say, the Mars rovers is tiny compared to the actual size of Mars itself. The landers that have gone to Venus, we've only seen a couple of spots for a couple of hours total, and we have not explored any vast amount of the space that's out there, which we totally need to do. Christian Cardenas. When the universe ends in a big freeze, can we escape to a new universe or a parallel universe in the far off universe and will the intelligence make something that we can go to another universe to live there? Can you answer my question please? When we tell people that the future of the universe is that, that everything is going to expand and everything is going to cool down and, and everything is going to be expanding apart until there's no usable energy left in the universe, they find that really sad and, and they feel like like, there's got to be some way that we can fix this, right? How do we fix this problem of that the universe is going to not die exactly, but be, you know, in the end, it's going to be cold and dead and empty. And, and so then we go like, well, maybe there's going to be parallel universes and maybe we can come up with some kind of technology. Maybe we can escape this universe and go to that other universe. And I get that thinking. And yet, there's nothing in the laws of physics, no discoveries that we know of right now that tells us that there could be any other universe at all. We just know that there's, there's this universe and it runs under the laws of physics that it has, and we don't know. And we, we learn that the sun is going to blow it up to a red giant and it's going to wipe out the earth. Or when we learn that there are black holes that are eventually going to absorb matter, and those black holes themselves are going to evaporate, we feel sad. We feel sad that black holes will die. It, so, and yet sometimes, you know, we don't think about making sure that we eat healthy food and get a lot of exercise and, and really make sure that we get the most out of this life that we have. If the laws of physics change, then, then as soon as we find out new things, or not, uh, our understanding of the laws of physics change, then we will try to understand what's possible next. But for now, this is the future that we see for the universe. And I know it's not happy, but it's nice to know what the future holds. And so enjoy this life that we've got. Eat your vegetables and exercise. Bernard Rabinald. If you fired a gun on the moon towards the Earth, would the bullet come back down? The 
fastest bullet in the world, and I did some quick Googling, is like 1.7, 1.2 kilometers per second. And <clears throat> that is less than the escape velocity of the moon, which is like 2.7, 2.9 kilometers. Sorry, I'm doing this off the top of my head. So the bottom line is pretty much the fastest bullet that you could fire from any gun on Earth would not be able to escape the gravity of the moon. It would go up very high, and then it would stop, and then it would come back down. And the problem is that on the moon, there's no atmosphere, and so there's no terminal velocity for that, uh, for that bullet coming back down. So it's going to come back down with the same speed and velocity that it went up at. And no, so right now any gun, now we could totally build a gun that could escape the moon, maybe with a rocket on it, but it's theoretically possible with some kind of rail gun or electromagnetic weapon that would be able to do it. But right now with just kinds of the guns that you can buy, you couldn't shoot the earth and, and hit somebody on the earth because your bullet would just come back down on top of you. Now, if you shot it sort of at an angle, it would go really far around the moon, but it would still crash back into the moon. David Agronoff. Hey Fraser, what would skydiving on Mars feel like? I understand it's fast because of the lack of air, but wouldn't the lack of gravity balance it out? Skydiving on Mars would be very different than skydiving on Earth. So like, let's say you were at an altitude of 3,000 meters and you, and you did your jump. Now you would accelerate more slowly than you would on Earth. So you would go faster and faster and faster, but a person who was on Earth would, would be falling more quickly than you would. But on Earth, you would reach your terminal velocity at, uh, what, about 200 kilometers per hour, and then you wouldn't fall any faster because the air is pushing against you and you're, you, know, you're, you reach kind of the maximum speed that you can as you fall through the air. But on Mars, the terminal velocity is about 1,000 kilometers per hour. So, so you would start off more slowly, but then you would just keep falling and you'd go faster and you'd go faster and you'd go faster. And eventually you'd be going 1,000 kilometers per hour until the wind resistance balanced you out and you stopped speeding up. And you would hit that velocity pretty quickly. So you would actually get to the bottom of Mars much more quickly than if you fell uh, on Earth. Now the problem is, is that then, what kind of, how do you stop yourself, right? How many parachutes? You're, you're dead. And this is one of the big problems with spacecraft trying to land on Mars, is that the atmosphere is just not thick enough to really slow them down. And so if a spacecraft comes in and tries to aerobrake, tries to use like parachutes and stuff to slow itself down, there's just not enough atmosphere there to slow it down enough to stop it from impacting really hard. It's got to use some other way, like rockets. Julian Gayu. Isn't it the mass energy of the early universe that is the same as the present universe rather than the mere mass? Some mass is constantly turning into energy through various reactions and vice versa. So isn't it unlikely that the mass of the universe is exactly the same as it was shortly after the Big Bang? Yeah, I actually got that question a little wrong on the last question show. I said like the total mass in the universe doesn't change, but the reality is that it's the mass energy, the total mass energy equivalent. So, by Einstein's equation, you can turn mass into energy and energy into mass via e equals mc squared. So if you add up all of the mass in the universe, and then you add up all of the energy in the universe, and then you convert that energy into mass via e equals mc squared, you're going to have an amount of mass that's mass, an amount of mass that comes from energy, and those two num those add those two numbers together and you will get a total. This is the mass energy of the universe. In the early universe, that was more mass. In the later universe, that could very well be much more energy. But if you still run that calculation together, again, you're going to come up with the same answer, the total amount of mass energy in the universe. So thanks to all the people that, uh, that caught me on that, and you're absolutely right. That is a better, more specific answer. Chin Jeremy. Hey, Fraser. Uh, curious question. What if the moon actually spins, rotates, just like the Earth, and orbits the Earth at a faster rate than it is doing right now? Will it have any impact on us Earthlings? Cheers. If the moon is orbiting the Earth at a faster rate, what that means, I, I'm sort of interpreting that, that, that the moon is passing us in the sky more quickly. Right now it takes, whatever, 28 days to go around the Earth. Imagine it took five days. And you would see the moon go past and the moon would go past. Now that closer distance would cause, it's the closer distance that would cause the problems. You would get much greater tides, you would get uh, a different sort of light cycle, it would be far brighter in the sky. 
and but you would still have the moon drifting away from the earth and over time it would drift back out to some farther position where it would be really bad is if the moon took shorter than one earth day to go around the earth so if say the moon took 23 hours to orbit the earth then what you would get is in fact the moon would now be falling inward to the earth and within a few million years it would be broken up and eventually crash into the earth which would be very bad once again thank you so much for sending in all of your questions that was a lot of fun i really appreciate it wherever you are on my channel on any episode if a question comes to your mind type it in right there i will gather a bunch of them up here and answer them on this show all right we'll see you next week i'm gonna leave now in the in the forest right here Are we still here? Bye. <laughs>